but it's like when you go on a trip and you plan a vacation. You're planning a vacation not because you want to learn a lesson, not because you're attempting to gain some knowledge about something. You plan your trips because you want to have an experience. There's certain things you want to go see. You want to interact with things that you've never interacted with. You might want to go eat food you've never eaten before. You might want to see sites you've never seen before. You might want to go have um, time with somebody that is really precious and one-on-one -on -one with just the people that you're spending that trip with. And those reasons are at the heart of why we are here. We are here for the experience. And to discount that is to discount the very essence of what makes this life so beautiful. So again, it's not, I don't have scientific fact. I just know that we do, nor do I know, I, I can't prove that everything that happens to each of us was intentionally designed to be that way. Maybe yes, maybe no, sometimes yes, sometimes no. However, what I do know is that whatever body we land in with whatever DNA and whatever crisis happens in life are absolute huge learning opportunities that may have all been the plan of this lifetime for this soul and or maybe some of them are just learning opportunities because there's a vast amount of learning that we each need. <laughs> so I don't wanna sound righteous about that, except my attitude about that is, now I get whatever happens is an opportunity for learning. It may have been chosen, it may have been chosen by me instead of for me, but in any case, it's my soul and this human personality that helped co-create it and I now take 100% responsibility instead of blaming it, even the crisis on something caused by someone else, because I'm 100% responsible for choosing every incident in which I find myself and accepting Absolutely. it or not and being part of it or not. And therefore, not only the great things, I deserve some credit for helping to co-create, but, but the, the so-called critical things and crises I get to go, well, here I am. What am I here for? Instead of seeing it only as some awful thing. So therefore, everybody, whether they're in a male, female, straight, gay, old, young, able, disabled, uh, those are life experiences that may be connected with the prior lives of that soul. And maybe they're continuations of it. My experience is of my prior two lives that I am exactly the same soul. And each of those lifetimes I'm aware of were pieces of the same learning, which doesn't mean I'm just repeating and not growing. It's growth beyond where I was in those. And so that's, that's my answer based on my experience. And I, I didn't care. I just had this drive to get to the light, the source, the power. Uh, which was totally blinding light, yet I could look at it. It was almost an oxymoron. <laughs> and uh, I got to the light, and I said, why was my life so difficult? And the essence, the light, God, whatever you want to call it, the source, said, don't you remember? You chose this. And he brought in some guides that individually took me to a table and said, remember when you chose this? You also chose these things and we told you not to because it was too much to handle. So, but you insisted, you wanted to do it. And then they sent in more guides who went through the same process because I kept choosing a lot of things. Apparently I wanted to do it all in one lifetime. And, um, and then I recalled the choices I made pre-birth, which, sort of solidified and said that was okay. So I went back to the light. And when you're in this heavenly space, you know things by thought processes. You know what each other is thinking. And it was simple and natural and wonderful. And he was beautiful. He had big blue eyes. He had a beard, a gray beard. He had like a turban around his head. He was dressed in gold and velvet and green and he was gorgeous and I felt like I knew him forever. And he looked ancient and young at the same time. And he said to me, 
are you ready to come? It was just simple as that. And in that moment, I remembered that my soul chose to come to Earth. I remembered where I was before I was born. I remembered that all of our souls choose to come here, that this is a wonderful university, that we're not here by random accident, we're not here as victims, that we come here to choose, to study, to learn, and to grow. And that on some level, this is like a wonderful theater. It's like a big university, we all play our part, and when our time to go comes, we leave. So, as I understand it, by design, we don't remember when we come in that we've prearranged a lot of stuff. We don't remember what our soul's plan is or whether, or, or even that we, there is such a thing or that we have made one. Um, why is that? I think there are a few reasons. One is that by completely forgetting what life on the other side is like, completely forgetting your life plan, and even your identity as an eternal non-physical being, what that does is that it makes everything that happens here on Earth seem a lot more serious and intense than it actually is. In other words, if you remembered your pre-birth plan and your identity as an eternal soul, you would be very much aware that life on Earth is nothing more than a play <laughs> on a stage. But because we forget who we really are, it seems very real and it seems very serious and important and intense. And there's a lot of value in that because when it seems that way, you experience very intense emotions and the, a lot of the growth and learning on the earth plane comes through experiencing intense emotions, learning how to relate to them and work with them skillfully. So you don't want to deprive yourself of the experience of intense emotions by remembering everything about your pre-birth plan. Another reason I think the amnesia is so important is that it, it's very much like the difference between an open book test and a closed book test in school. Uh, you know if it's going to be an open book test, you tend not to study hard. You think you'll just look up the answers in the textbook during the test. But if it's a closed book test, you tend to study harder and therefore you learn more. Well, if you come in remembering your pre-birth plan in its entirety, it basically makes life like uh, an open book mm -hmm. test. You just don't learn as much. Uh, and then I think also... Um, a lot of the growth and learning on the earth plane comes through the experience of asking a lot of questions, deciding which questions are important enough to pursue, and then actually pursuing the answers to those questions. If you remembered all of your pre-birth plan, you would have no questions, and then you would be deprived of that very valuable learning so opportunity. Before you come into body, you make decisions about what you would like to learn here. So let's just take a, a common learning uh, let's say that somebody wants to deepen in compassion. So you set that as your broad intention. And then in discussion with your guides, you work out a specific life plan that will help you to deepen in compassion. The soul learns best through opposites. So the typical pre-birth plan is what I refer to in my books as the learning through opposites plan. What does that mean? It means that you choose to experience the very opposite of the thing you want to learn and the reason you do that is that it gives you both the opportunity and the motivation to learn what it is you want to learn. So if you're trying to deepen in compassion, a common way to go about doing that would be to choose to incarnate into a nuclear family in which you will be treated with a profound lack of compassion. The lack of compassion in your external environment is supposed to drive you within where you will hopefully over time develop self-compassion. And then having done that, Later in life, take the compassion that you have gifted to yourself and turn it outward in service to others. That, in broad strokes, is a very common type of pre-birth mm. plan. Would, would you think that perhaps um, in a, an enlightened world, if we ever achieve such a thing where the predominant level of consciousness is very high, that remembering past lives and between lives periods and all that will be kind of um, the norm? I, I do believe that. And what you've just described is, as I understand it, what it's like when we're back home on the other side in the non-physical realm. We do remember our past lives. We have complete, full access to all of that information. Uh, and that's because we're at a higher vibration when we're back on the other side. And because having access to that information is for our highest and greatest good. But when we come into body, 
most people are best served by not remembering that and not having access to that information. And that's the main reason why they don't have access to it while yeah. they're here. Uh, now I'm going to jump to a bit that's somewhat immediately preceding this life where I had, I had taken a long break. Okay, I, I had lived many experiences and I took a long break. I, I would just decide I was done for a while. I was just not doing a physical thing for a while. I was taking a long break. And I, I remember this guide coming to me repeatedly over and over, like, are you ready to go back yet? Are you ready to go back yet? Uh, basically like reminding me of my own intention and just trying to um, kind of nudge me back onto the path. And I, um, I, I put him off for a while and eventually I said, okay, I'm ready to go back. And I remember reviewing with him the state of who I was, like what I had done, what I had been, and like all these, um, this is really hard to, it's really hard to describe all the stuff's like impossible to describe, but the qualities of what I had been and who I was. And the thing that I needed to work on was obvious. The thing that, and I hate to put it that way, it's not really work on, but the, I, I could tell that I had a, uh, like, it was just very obvious. Like if you look at like a, <laughs> I don't know, like a report or something. Like the one thing, like I really needed to work on was, it was like glaring. I was like, oh yeah, I really need, I really need to, <laughs> to do that. And it involved a, a fear that I had experienced in one specific life that in that life, the fear was so profound and so powerful that it drove me to be a very uh, nasty person. I was a very non-helpful <laughs> person. I, I damaged many other people. I mean, you can't I say damage. You can't truly, the soul can't truly be damaged. We can't be damaged. But in the life, I had caused a lot of damage because of this fear. And it, I ended up dying in a very painful, agonizing way. Uh, and so, and so I, I was surprised at how incredibly deep that fear had been for me, how, how deep that fear that was in me. And so I wanted to re-engage that fear. And as I reviewed this, I knew the, oh my gosh, the incredible amount of expansion that would be possible if I, could, if I could do this. If I could meet this fear and integrate this certain energy to this degree, I just knew it would be unspeakably beautiful and powerful if I could do that. But, it was so, but even then I could see that the vibrational distance was so extreme that I remember asking the guy, is it even possible? Like, has anyone, in, has any other being in, in creation ever done this? Has, has any other being ever done something this extreme in this kind of way? And, and he said, yes. And, uh, and, and it was, there's like this encouraging, like, and you have all time to do so. Like, there's no, there's no hurry. So, um, so I knew, and this sounds kind of, as a human, this sounds kind of alien to me, but at the time, I just knew with complete confidence, it, if it can be done, I will do it. If it can be done, I will do it. I knew that I had that ability. So with that being said, they brought me a life that was uh, really perfect for this intention of mine. And so I reviewed this life and it was perfect. Uh, it was like almost as good as they get. And I, ex and I accepted the life and I accepted the veil. Okay, so the veil of forgetfulness, this process of incarnating is what I remember the most out of all of this. And that process is uh, very abrupt and shocking. <laughs> so in this life, I accepted the veil, the veil came over me and then I was in the womb. But, okay, so when the veil came over me, I felt my knowing be cut off. I felt my vibration plummet from great heights down to, uh, the low, 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 lower and lower and go lower still and then lower some more and keep going lower and lower and then you finally get there and when you're there, it's so low, it's ridiculous and you're cut off. I mean, at least for me, I was, I felt cut off and I felt like I didn't have that connectedness with other people anymore, other beings anymore. I didn't have my knowing anymore and it was terrifying and I wasn't even born yet. I was just in the womb and I was like, I was terrified and I, and I was only there for a very, very short time and I said, you know what? I'm not doing this. This is, this is not happening. I mean, this is so ridiculous. This is so low vibration. This is so dark. I am not doing this. And I summoned my might and I smote the veil. I smote, I fought my way out. So um, I, I remember going to this place that can only be described as like, I don't know, a, a veil acceptance simulator room. Uh, it was like a place you go where they, 
they you practice surrendering to the veil and having your knowing cut off uh, and feeling separate and dark and alone. And you, it's kind of like diving into a pool and then, and then seeing how long you can stay underwater. And then, and then, but if, because this is just a trainer, you can jump back out if you get too scared, you know, but you practice. Um, and I remember practicing and uh, basically it had to do with my willingness to feel the fear and my willingness to allow and not resist. So after doing that, they brought me this life. And um, this life was not as optimal as the first one would have been. Uh, it was still good. It was quite good. But each life is only so good because the, the soul, the spirit, has, is rather complex in what makes it up. And in my case, I just knew I had many qualities and like a certain, there's like a certain type of my nature. And that nature has to like interface with the life somehow. And then it, that has to work within the context of what you're trying to do, what you want to do. And this life was pretty good. You know, it wasn't perfect, but it was, it was good. It was good. So I remember reviewing this life in great detail and reviewing what I can only describe as a vast flow chart or like a, like a tree of uh, all the things that might or could or would happen in, my, in this life. And there were, it started like kind of like, if you imagine a tree like tipped on its side, like, like thicker trunk and then like it went out to branches and there's all these, some paths were very likely, some paths were a lot less likely. But it wasn't about events. Well, there, I mean, there were definitely events in it, but it wasn't so much about events as how it would feel, how it would be to be that. Like, how will it be to be that person in these different possible avenues of how this life might unfold? And I went through millions of possibilities all within the blink of an eye. It was easy to do that. I, was, I remember reviewing just tons of huge amounts of information all at once. And, um, and I knew even then that it was very likely that I would experience a trauma in my 20s that would crush me and that would help facilitate uh, my opportunity to re-experience this fear that I wanted to re-experience and integrate. Um, so I was super excited to, to do this, to accept this, even though I knew it would be hard. Um, I, and I knew that the body, this body, had certain limitations that other bodies do not. And that this body would be difficult in a certain ways on a day-to-day -day level that would like challenge my ego or something. It would make it difficult for me in a way that I, I would be forced to um, turn inward and I would have to find strength. <laughs> and also I wouldn't be, because I, I had, it's hard to explain, but I had a sense that I, it would be challenging enough to the ego that I would, I would have to, um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to go totally down the ego path because it would be too challenging. So anyway, I reviewed all this and I, uh, I remember there having to be a moment to accept and I don't remember that moment, but I, but I do remember after that uh, waiting uh, for this to start the life. And I was, uh, I remember being in a state where I was still timeless and it was wonderful. And I remember the, I remember this light, this powerful light. And then I remember my, the guy coming to me and being like, all of a sudden, and not not rude, but almost rude, like now, go now. You have to go now, right now. You know, like <laughs> getting my attention, like super, like now, buddy. And so I was like, okay, now. So then, I, I, the next thing is, I was at these beings that I can only describe as tinkerers or technicians. These beings who they're like technical in nature, and they help apply the veil to me. So it, they do this. I don't know how to describe it. There's this thing like the like the spirit has certain nature and qualities and the life has certain something going on and the body and they have to like do this thing where it like, I don't know, they make everything fit <laughs> somehow. So they were doing that and uh, they asked me one more time, are you sure? And I knew that this was the point of no return. And if I said yes to here, I was, I was in, I was in for the ride, I was strapped in. And I remember saying yes uh, and uh, and, and then the veil coming over me again. And, uh, okay, so this time I just, my intention was, okay, just don't fight it. <laughs> just, just let go, don't resist, just allow. Uh, and, and I remember, okay, so like this, this drop in vibration is meaningful to, to uh, explain, but if you, I don't know, just as a metaphor, but if you imagine like an ant that produces a pitch, like, 
you know, and then you'd have a bell and you turn it down, ooh, and it turns down. Well, I turn all the way down and then turn down more and more and more and more and more and more and keep cranking it down and you know, keep going. And that's how it felt in the vibration of the being coming down into this super dense, super tight, super cut off, uh, you know, like, a, like going to the vacuum of space, I think is a good metaphor I like to use. It's like you go to a place where there's just no heat and no air. <laughs> there's, just, there's just empty space. That's how it felt but also super dense, like coming down and being shoved into a tuna can, you know, like a fish can. <laughs> and it was incredibly uh, jarring, but I just strove not to, not to fight it. And um, okay, so one of the things I had asked before I, in, in the review process was I had asked to have a small amount of memory this time. I said, I don't want to forget everything. I want to have just a tiny, tiny little amount of memory, just a tiny little bit. You know, and, and they said I could do that. They had said that I could do that, but it would make it more challenging. It would make this life more difficult because the contrast would be even greater. Uh, and at the time I knew that even that contrast was, was like all contrast, an opportunity for growth. So I accepted. So anyway, as the veil came over me now, I was, I was feeling this and there was like this little window open that I, I, I surmise, I don't know for certain, but I think it had to do with that request because I had this light little window open that was not veiled all the way. And I remember like holding on for a super long time and being like, oh my gosh, this is crazy. And sending a signal back through the window, did it take back to the technicians and, uh, and then sending one, sing one, word, one, back, one signal back, yes. So I knew that the veil had been successfully applied. And I, so, I, so I allowed myself to uh, be in the womb. Uh, in peace and for a while. So then I was there for a while, okay? And it was all good. And then eventually I said, I'm not doing this. This is like, the, I, once again, the darkness and the cutoffness and the, and the lack of connectedness. And the, I was like, this stuff, I'm not doing this again. So again, I reached this point where I'm like, this is ridiculous. This is just so ridiculous. So at that moment, I began to, summon my energy again so that I could fight my way out again. Um, but as that happened, I had this very humbling moment and it's like the most holy, it's the most holy precious memory for me. But um, I remember the spirit of God coming to me and showing me that I was still, well, showing me what I was, I was still all that is. It showed me the stars and the solar system. And I remember feeling the churning of the sun and the, and the, um, the joy of that and knowing that it was still me. And, and the spirit said to me, this is still what you are. You can never not be this. It's the most holy thing for me to remember because that's what we really are. That's what all of us really are. And it, so it's very hard to remember that now because I feel deep in the human experience right now. I'm, I'm not close to there right now. I'm deep in the weeds. But, uh, but at the time, it, um, it calmed me a lot and I, it, made me, uh, it, it made me relax. And I was like, oh, good. Oh, that's good. I'm still that, that's good. So then I relaxed. And as I did that, I just was able to let go and, and experience the uh, simple, relatively simple experience of being in the womb. <laughs> okay, so then the next memory is the day I was born. I remember, I remember the day I was born. I remember, um, I remember just one visual image of the room after I was out. And I remember seeing the layout of the room. And then when I was older, I drew the room from my mother. And I said, you were here, the, the bed was here, here was the window, here was the heating grate, here was the doctor. And she said I was right, which I knew I, I would be. Um, but beside the visual memory, that wasn't the most important memory. The most important memory was just like the, the experience, the shock. Uh, there was no context yet. Like I was just, I had no, I had no intellectual context whatsoever. I was like a clean slate. So I just, it was just sense data and stuff going on. There was cold and shock and light and touching and <laughs> very intense sense data. And I remember being intensely curious and looking around and being like, what is this place? Where am I? 
and looking at these beings who are taking care of me or doing whatever they're doing and being in awe of them and actually feeling love for them. And actually, it's funny because just last week I was talking to my, my father about this memory. And, uh, and he said, that's interesting. He said, because the day you were born, your eyes were wide open. And he said, you were looking at everything with such an intenseness and an intense curiosity. And he said he couldn't believe that such a young baby could have such an intense uh, you know, curiosity. And I remember that. I remember being like, what is this? It was so welcoming. No matter, I mean, I said, I don't believe in you. <laughs> How come I'm here? And again, the message was, you belong here, this is your home. And I just stood with that and sat with that for what felt like days. And eventually um, a being approached me who appeared to be female, although she said that was a form that she took in order to make it easier for me to relate to her. She looked like a human-ish female, nothing really clearly defined but vaguely, you know, human. She had, appeared to have long hair and, you know, had a vaguely human shape and a vaguely female shape. But she again welcomed me with love. And it was love that, that I didn't, that I felt through me. It was really odd. I could feel that love was a force coming through me. And it was a welcoming, peaceful kind of thing. And she said, I'm going to be your guide for the next little while. I'm going to teach you about this place and what you need to know to take back into your own life so that you can make your life better and, and what you want it to be. And when she said, you're going to go back to your life, I just immediately said, I don't want to go back. I want to stay here with you. And she said, no, it's your mission, your purpose to go back. So we argued about that sort of for a little while and eventually she explained to me that I had agreed to go back, that I wasn't meant to stay here and that I had accepted that already prior to my birth. How did you understand that? She showed it to me from her own perspective. So she showed me myself in a very vaguely kind of spiritual form and I knew it was me agreeing to this with kind of a small council of other beings, agreeing to what I was going to do, but from her own perspective. So she was one of these um, entities or spiritual entities that was around me, but she showed me that whole scene from her perspective. She kind of put it right into my mind mm -hmm. and into my heart. But I could also sense it from my own perspective as well. As well. So I was beginning to remember I saw it from, it was really odd. I saw it from both my own and from her perspectives. Hers was stronger. Um, but I, as, as soon as she showed all this to me and I heard myself, you know, here we would say I wrote, I agreed to a contract, but it was really more of a verbal or a, a heartfelt contract. When I remembered that I agreed to that with my heart, then it was like, oh, okay, I guess I'm going to be going back. When did you agree to this? before my birth into this body. Mm -hmm. So that's, you know. Um, so when did you know that? I Well, I only knew that during my NDE. I didn't remember it mm -hmm. until the middle of kind of my near-death experience. Right, okay. So it was part of, part of getting me to be okay with being sent back here was, you know, you already agreed to do this. Here's what it looked like. See if you can remember that, and, and I did. This light is what I call God. I, I'm more comfortable saying my creator, but there are no words. I have a complete absence of any kind of language. I don't even try. Uh, the language comes from my heart, and it speaks well. It's just that no one else can understand it. But this, this love was personal. And we communicated in a form of math and music, and I'm not skilled in either. When skeptics say, oh, you get what you expect, no. No, no, no. A, I wasn't expecting anything. And uh, math and music was perfect communication. I asked questions any fool 
want to ask God. I ask many questions. For instance, uh, you know, why are we here? And I was told pretty much we, we banged on the door for this life. Our souls, it sounds so philosophical, but we, we, our souls, or whatever you want to call it, insisted on being born. And that it was a, it was a, something we really wanted a lot. Uh, I asked about um, pain and suffering in my own way, and the answer was, uh, it's, you know, sadly, that's the way back to God. I mean, we, we in our fleshly existence, without some stress, kind of forget where we're from, and and um, and then there was something about free will, and you know, I'm not a theologian. Um, this had nothing to do with religion. It had to do with life and love. But the, what I would most like to convey is that, although I was asking you know, immensely profound questions, I thought, um, what I was getting back were I was remembering. It wasn't new information. It was like, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. It was fantastic. There's a lot of things about, about time and how time works. But uh, I think that what we do is that we said, like, major milestones. I just say it's like we have that knowing within ourselves. We Even before we come, I know that we, we is what we call a pre-plan. Yeah, yeah. But so always people ask me, so we are predestined. And I said, no, no, it actually it's even like it works here now. I could just decide I'm going to go to college. So I said a milestone. But what is going to happen before I have my degree? I don't know which electives I'm going to take, how many, how long I'm going to take doing these two years, three years. So I said it's the same thing. Yeah. It's like we set major goals and how we get there might vary. But they have an even more active role in the whole the whole process. They are the ones that help you set up your life lessons before you come in as well. They help you understand, you know, you say, I want to experience abuse because I've never done that before. And they'll say, well, how do you want to do it? Do you want it physical, mental, emotional? And they'll give you examples of what each one is. And then you choose, well, I think I want physical abuse. So then they say, well, you know, you can do it in a, a marriage. You can do it uh, in some militaries. You can do it in an oppressive nation. And then you choose how you want to experience that. Of course, you come down with amnesia. Uh -huh. So then you work through it and see if you understand that it's just a lesson, that you can learn from it, you can see how it feels, and then you can choose never to do it again. But you may not see the entire process until you go back home and your consul then says, okay, you know, let's sit back and watch the movies. Mm. This is what happened. This is what you want. What did you get out of it? It's all ours. It's all our freedom of choice. Okay. They just tell us what we could use. It's the whole... The whole journey is our own, is the individual souls. The consul, our guardians, are simply guides, and they can't interfere. And a few days later, I was riding on a moped in Hawaii, no helmet, and was in a car accident and died. Um, when it happened, I remember thinking, this was an exit point in life. I actually had the choice, as we all do, to decide for this to be my time to go. Um, we can talk more about that in another video, but we all actually have the option of choosing when we want to go or not. So I remember clear as day. Um, when I stepped to the other side, as it's so called, I had the option for that to be it. And I remember that very vividly. I graduate from college and six months later I'm driving down the highway on my way to a Christmas party and the universe intervenes and says, listen here sunshine, you signed up for something different. And I went, oh yeah, ooh, 
oh yeah. So it turns out that I had orchestrated with a very divine group of beings that if my free will and my intellect had not allowed me to recognize by the time I was 21 that I had signed up for service, that I came here to help people discover their own divinity, to reconnect with that part of them that has been lost through time, and that if I wasn't doing that, I was going to have to have a really big in the rear, which was the car accident. So I now spend my life talking to people like you and going, hey, just remember that you're divine and you don't have to die in the car accident. This is what I do. One of the things that I was shown in this room was my map or my soul plan laid out on this big massive marble-like table. Again, nothing like what we have here. And what I saw in that was my own creation of all of this that I had previously referred to as bad. All these experiences that I had labeled wrong or inappropriate or shouldn't have happened. My um, molestation by my grandfather when I was three years old. Um, my parents' divorce. Um, my own divorce. Um, my son being born early, all these things that I had labeled as bad um, now had no label at all. They just were. They were experiences in this map that I could now see. Um, and each of the souls that I had these experiences with um, were part of it. And in this experience, one of the big breakthroughs and recognitions for me was that the souls that had quote unquote hurt me the most were actually closest to me in my soul family. My grandfather who is no longer alive that molested me when I was three years old is in my soul family. And I had an agreement with him to carry out that experience. I'll have to explain in another video because it would take too much time to go into too much depth why we incarnate because when you hear this for many of you and then for some of you it may not arise the, the question comes why would I come here and choose and map out to be molested or to be abused or to be neglected or starved that creates this anger inside of the human being that says this shouldn't be happening. So I'll have to do another video on that because that's a whole other segment on itself of itself. Um, as I looked at this map, one of the things that occurred for me was um, I experienced each of the events again. And as there's no time, again, it was so fast, it was as if seconds were just passing and I was born again and I was three again and I was seven again and I was experiencing all these things and yes some of the experience was me doing things that would I label unkind or um, or mean and yet in this vision of my experiences there was no punishment or bad girl you shouldn't have done that or this is wrong or it shouldn't have been that way and you're here to you're here to face your demons or your sins none of that was was happening because there is none of that. There's nothing we can do here that is wrong. This is all mapped, this is all planned, this is all determined in advance. And so how can you penalize someone for something that you agree to from a soul perspective? This review was for no one but myself. For me to recognize that I'm perfect, I'm whole, I'm complete, I'm this amazing eternal being just as you are and that there's nothing I can do here that is wrong, even the act of killing myself. Part of your plan that you make, your contract, you decide how you're going to die, how you're going to exit. You gotta have a way to get out of the body. Nobody dies until they are ready to die. That may sound cold, 
may sound hard to understand. They don't know this consciously, but on the other part where they have made their plan, they know they are planning to go out at a certain time. They know how they're going to do it. They say, well, it'd be interesting. I think I'll go out in a train wreck. I haven't done that for a while, so let's try that, you know? <laughs> uh, you know, you decide how you're going to do it. And you're the one that actually makes the plan of how you're going to leave the body when the time comes. You, you go out in groups. Some people come in in groups. They like to be in groups. And they'll say, OK, we're going to go out on an earthquake. We'll go out together. Are we going to go out with 9-11? Nothing is ever an accident. It's all planned ahead of time. So when you look, you know these things, you can look at all of this from a totally different perspective. That uh, it's, all, it's more of a plan to everything than you realize. When you understand that, you can control your life, just like Ron was saying. I give lectures on that too. Once you realize everything in your life you have put there, you have created. You have done it. People don't like that because sometimes their lives are a mess. But when they realize you have put it in your life, if you've created it, you can just as easily uncreate it. Once you realize the power that you have, we are a creative being. We can do anything we want. But I like to think sometimes if the person makes ch changes in the way they, they want to go out, they can stay longer if they want to because I've had so many different things like this happen. But really, when it comes time to go, you have decided to go. OK. And then you speak of, and others also speak of soul groups. Like there, uh, I think that's the phrase you used, where there might be, I think I heard the number 17 or you know, some, some such number of people who kind of cluster together and, and reincarnate together over many, many lives, playing different roles. Um, you know, sometimes reversing roles and, and so on. Is that, is that a, you want to elaborate on that just a little bit? Yeah, soul group, as I understand it, is uh, 17, 25 souls, somewhere around there, who are at the same stage of evolution, which is another way of saying the same vibration, uh -huh. the same frequency. And you and the other members of your soul group take turns playing every conceivable role for each other. So you will be mother and daughter, father and son, brother and sister, best of friends, mortal enemies, teacher and student. And at the soul level, there's no judgment of any of these roles, even though quote unquote negative roles, they're all viewed as opportunities for learning and healing huh. and expansion. So same level of evolution is an interesting phrase because many people might think there's no way I'm at the same level of evolution that my parents were at or something. You know, they they seem so superficial and judgmental and negative and abusive and everything. And I'm not that kind of person. So I must be at a different level of evolution. Yeah, you, you really cannot assess soul age or evolutionary stage accurately by looking at the superficial aspects of somebody's personality. And the reason you can't assess it accurately is that these kinds of roles are scripted before birth. So if you feel that your parents are unenlightened or unevolved, for example, uh, most likely you ask them in your pre-birth planning session to play that kind of role for you because you felt that that would best foster your evolution in this mm. life. So in other words, somebody might be an abusive drunk or something and seemingly not very highly evolved, but they could actually be a very highly evolved person or soul playing that kind of role. That's exactly right. And I'll, I'll share with you uh, an interesting and, and funny true story. Uh, I'm sure many of your viewers know sure. who Edgar Casey is. Uh, for those who, ha who haven't heard the name, uh, Casey, who's now back on the other side, is regarded by many people as the greatest psychic American medium who ever lived. And late in Casey's career, after he'd read for thousands and thousands of people, he was visited by two wealthy women, sisters from New York City. And the sisters said to him, Mr. Casey, we are at the end of our rope in regard to our brother. He lives under a bridge in New York. He drinks too much. We come from a wealthy family but he long ago squandered his share of the family fortune. We've done everything we can think of over the years to help him turn his life around and nothing has worked. Mr. Casey, what can you tell us? Can you say anything that will help us help our brother? Well, upon hearing this, Casey did what he always did, which is he went into trance. He went into the Akashic record, which is the complete non-physical record of everything relevant to the earth plane, including the pre-birth planning. And then he said to the two sisters, 
your brother is the single most highly evolved soul about whom I have ever obtained information. <laughs> and the, the three of you agreed before any of you were born for him to do exactly what he's been doing so that the two of you could learn to be more compassionate. Mm. Well, as you can imagine, this was not exactly the response the sisters were hoping for, but that's how it works. That's what's really going on here. I'm playing. Yeah, here. I mean, if we do choose our our lives, it would take a noble soul to say, "All right, I'm going to live this miserable life in order to benefit others." It would almost be like a bodhisattva kind of gesture. Well, you know, service to others is a, a component of every single pre-birth plan I've ever looked at. And very often the souls who are taking on big challenges, challenges that require a lot of courage, like planning homelessness, for example, or alcoholism or drug addiction or certain illnesses like AIDS, they are often very highly evolved souls and they're taking on those challenges partly for their own growth and learning, but also in service to others in the same way that the brother was helping the two sisters learn compassion. You know, in my first book, Your Soul's Plan, the very first story in that book is about a man who plans before he was born to have the AIDS virus. And the reason I put that as the first story in the first book is that, you know, we as a society have so many harsh judgments about people who have AIDS. We say things like, he or she must have been promiscuous, he or she must not have used protection. Some people actually believe that AIDS is God's way of punishing homosexuals for being homosexuals. But what we find out when we research this gentleman's pre-birth plan is that he was a very highly evolved soul, extremely courageous for planning to have the AIDS virus. And when we went into his pre-birth planning session, we heard him talking about how he wanted to be a teacher of compassion, how he felt that at this time in linear history, society was tremendously judgmental. And he wanted to give people an opportunity to put judgment aside and feel compassion in their hearts. So here is somebody that we as a society judge so very harshly. And yet he was coming in motivated by love, motivated by altruism to be a teacher mm. to the rest of us. If you look at, look at the video games again as, a, as an analogy, you know, I use that a lot, but it actually is a pretty good analogy. The big difference being that those are programmed and our virtual reality just has evolved. But if we look at that, how do you define a character? How do you birth a character in The Sims? Well, you go to, or in the world of Warcraft, you go to some page where characters are created and you pick attributes, okay? Now you can't just pick any attribute. There are some rules on the kind of attributes you can pick because otherwise everybody would pick the character with all the you know, most wonderful attributes. And that wouldn't make as interesting a game as if you had a lot of varied characters that were good for different things in different ways and it becomes a more interesting game that way. So there is a, there is a kind of limitation to your picking, but within those limitations you get to pick the attributes and the kind of character. Is it an elf? Is it a barbarian? Is it this or is it that? And within those you can pick how clever is it? Does it do spells or is it strong? You know, or what are its hit points and so on. And then once you're done, that character then, as you've configured it, becomes an avatar for you and you can play that character in the game. All right, now let's look at the consciousness part of it and we'll see that it's very similar. You know, in the consciousness game of, of physical reality, if you will, in this virtual reality, the virtual reality is evolved, okay? It's not programmed, it's evolved. So it started with the big digital bang, and I've talked about that in other, in, in other uh, talks that I've given. And if that doesn't really, if this doesn't make sense to you, go back and look at those beginning talks, please. Uh, I won't repeat all that here. But it starts with the big digital bang, and then it, this simulation of this reality, which we call physical reality, starts to unfold until you have suns and places like Earth and cells and biology and all that kind of stuff evolves in this virtual reality. Now, this simulation is just simulating potential. It, it forms the structure according to the rule set that defines this reality frame. All right. Now, so how do we get the consciousness 
connected to the avatar in the virtual reality. Now, what's that like? Well, let's say that in this simulation, we've let the rule set evolve enough that it has people in it. It has critters and people and bushes and trees and basically our environment here. So all of that in the simulation is just potential, okay? Based on the probability of what is likely to happen given the rule set and the initial conditions and so on. All right, so now you have in this simulation, you'll have a couple who are going to have a child. Now you have that in the Sims as well. You have couples that have children in the Sims. So, you know, this is something you can simulate. You know, it's, uh, but again, this is not programmed. This is an evolved simulation. Well, that child that they're going to have is a potential child, just as they are potential people. There's potential there. Now, you are consciousness, and you'd like to get into this virtual reality experience game. Okay, you're looking for an open slot, right, to get in. Well, you can look at all of the various potentials out there that suit you. Okay, here's a child, and because of the parent A and parent B that, that uh, made this, that, you know, that, are, that are producing this child, you have a certain genetic set that will give you some limitations. Okay, now these are limitations again in terms of probability. Okay, so you've got some limitations. That's like the character in World of Warcraft. You can't just pick anything. You're limited with the kind of things and combinations and whatever that you can pick. So there's limitations. But within those limitations, there's lots of probability and chance that this might happen or that might happen. So you, so you look at the potential of it and you say, well, okay, this one suits me. Of all of the potentials that are in this virtual reality game, that's a potential that will suit my next incarnation pretty well, reasonably well. And sure, there's some unknowns to it, and there's some chances the way things might go together or turn out or experience. You know, you can't, you can't eliminate all the variables, right? This is not a deterministic exercise. This is once that you, you know, you kind of, you know, you, you play the game and you take your chances, you know, sort of thing. So what you do then is that you take your own data. Remember, you as a consciousness are also information. You're also memory and experience. You know, all the things you've ever thought, done, said, all the quality you've accumulated up to this time, you can reduce that all to information. Information that describes you uniquely, your experience, your choices. Well, you can take that information and put that information, insert that information into this potential being, just like picking the characteristics of your you know, virtual avatar in your, in your computer game. So you do that. Now, once you've done that, now your information has become, I don't know what we say, uploaded to, injected into, however you want to say it. This is a metaphor, right? So however you want to put this into this potential being. Well, now this potential being is born and grows up and in its larger sense, it is you because it started with your, you know, it was your data input that was there. So that's kind of how you connect to it. So it has your data input. So it's like you take your data card, you know, like your credit card or something. You take your data card and you put it in the slot and it downloads your data you know, into this potential being. And from then on, you work out through this virtual reality, the experiences that this potential being will have with other beings and other things in the environment that's in this multiplayer game. But it's you in there because you put your own data as part of the input to it. That's your part of the selection process, just like your part of the selection process in the world of Warcraft is to pick how much hit points, you know, does this being do magic? Uh, you know, what, does, what are its characteristics? Well, you get, to own, you get to load your own data. So now this being starts out with a quality of consciousness that you brought to it. That's part of what you download when you stick your own data file into that being. So now you're integrated, that's you now, okay? And this being, of course, is an infant and it has to learn how to interpret the data what all the data means. How do you interpret that? 
And that's what this infant is doing. You know, it takes this infant a long time just to realize that that, that thing that flies around in front of its face and scratches it sometimes is its own hand. You see, it takes it a while to figure that out. Oh, you know, that's a part of me, you know. And then later, oh, I can control it. And then it spends weeks practicing controlling it until that control gets better and better and it can kind of, you know, make it go where it wants to and so on. It has to learn all of the data and how to interpret every piece of data that it gets in its environment. When it sees things, it has to learn to interpret them. Oh, that's mom, that's dad, that's the crib. You know, that's the wall or the ceiling or the mobile I'm looking at. And it, it learns to, it gets the data, but at first has no idea how to interpret it. It interprets it through experience. It learns and it grows. And after it's, you know, two or three years old, it knows what room, ceiling, arms, hands, legs, clothes, beds, you know, it has a lot of, of images now, a lot of input symbols that it can give interpretations to, that it has metaphors, that it has part of its experience base. So that's what it's doing. But at the same time, it's got your input. When you put your data card in there and said, well, this is me, well, that data is loaded in there too. So it sees it not only through its potential ability to see because it's in this simulation, but it sees it through your own filter of how you should see it and how you would deal with those things and how you would interpret them. You see, so it brings along your quality of conscious, which means it brings along your fear, your ego, your lack of love, because that's the way you are. See, it brings all those things along with it, or it brings your, you know, great quantity of love, because that's the way you are. So then it becomes a use. So that's kind of the way to look at the process. So then here you are now in this, this simulation, and it's just a potential simulation, and now there's a character, an avatar, in this potential possibilities within the simulation and the interactions with other potential beings that has your fundamental stuff in it. And that becomes you then. And you play that through until this character, you know, gets run over by a truck or gets old and dies or whatever. And then you repeat the process. Except now you've changed because you've learned things. You've grown up. So now the next time you do this, when you bring out your data card, you know, and you want to insert it in the slot to say, you know, I'm going to insert my data into this potential being in the simulation, then it's different. It's a different you. And the next time you make different choices, perhaps different situations. No, we as consciousness, you see, are very different than our potential characters. We as consciousness are a whole different kind of being than this avatar we're playing on the game. Just like we, as conscious beings, are, whole, are very different than that sim character that we play. You know, it's the same thing. You know, we're, we're not that sim character. You know, we're a totally different kind of being than that sim character. Well, that's the way it is with us. We as consciousness are really a very different kind of being than that human that we're playing in this earth, you know, virtual reality in this particular um, universe. But we, we think of this physical body, you know, as being the source of things. It isn't. It's just potential in a virtual reality game. Back to the thing about group casualties. Um, do you have anything more to say about that? I mean, there must be some you know, you say soul groups are maybe 17 or 25 people, but 3,000 people in the Twin Towers or some huge number in, in some, you know, other ca catastrophe. Um, what is, it seems like there's something more significant to that, like 6,000, 6 million Jews in the Holocaust. There seems to be some huge group karma that um, is being played out in circumstances like that. Well, it's more of a, a group uh -huh. intention uh, is the way that I would put it. And I'll, I'll talk about a, a large scale event that I know something about. Uh, you may remember that a few years ago, there was a mm -hmm. tsunami yeah. in Southeast Asia. And that tsunami killed approximately 100,000 right. people. Uh, I've asked about that in the channeling sessions I've done for Your Soul's Plan and Your Soul's Gift. And what I was told was that those 100,000 or so souls wanted before they were born for planet Earth to get to a certain vibration or frequency by a certain point mm -hmm. in linear time. 
And they said, if it looks as though the Earth will not get to that vibration by that point in linear time, then we agree to give our lives in a large-scale natural disaster because we know that the result of that disaster will be all the governments of the world putting aside their differences in order to funnel aid into this region of the world. And you might recall that's exactly what happened. After that tsunami struck Southeast Asia, all the governments of the world temporarily put aside their differences and coordinated in order to funnel aid into Southeast Asia. That decision to do that was a massive outpouring of love and compassion, which raised the vibration of the entire planet tremendously. That was exactly the desired effect that those 100,000 or so souls wanted to have by giving up their lives in a large-scale natural disaster. And you know, there's an old expression, where you stand depends upon where you sit. This is a very good illustration of that because if you are a human being who sits, so to speak, in the third dimension, then where you stand on the tsunami is that it was a terrible tragedy. And certainly from a human perspective, it was. But if you are a spirit guide who, quote unquote, sits in a higher dimension, then where you stand on the tsunami is that it was a great blessing to Earth. And from that perspective, it was. So there you have two diametrically opposed perspectives, and yet both are correct from yeah. the viewpoint of... It is interesting how disasters and catastrophes tend to bring out people's compassion. I mean, just in the last couple of weeks when they had all that flooding and from the hurricane in North and South Carolina, um, you know, just all kinds of people poured in from all over the place. There was this whole group of people with airboats and other kinds of boats that calling themselves the Cajun Navy who came up from Louisiana to help. And, and, you know, you see all these scenes of, you know, these pe people just really full of heart, you know, um, which perhaps they don't experience as fully in their day-to-day -day lives, but having that enlivened by, by the disaster that they're able to somehow help with. So the people who are acting in evil or negative ways, uh, they fall into one of two broad categories. Sometimes they are on the other side, very light-filled, evolved souls who are agreeing at your request or someone's request to play a quote-unquote negative role so that you can grow and learn what you want to learn. The other broad category of people who are playing negative roles are less evolved souls who are carrying back into body some kind of unhealed pain, which it's often foreseen is going to lead them to act in evil or negative ways. Uh, but the tension there generally is that they're bringing the unhealed pain back into body with the hope of healing it, not with the intention of expressing it. Now, they know in advance that very often they may not be able to heal it, that it may get expressed, and this is all understood in the pre-birth planning, and the other souls with whom they're incarnating agree to that possibility. They say something like, we hope that you will be able to heal this as yet unhealed pain, but if you are not successful in that attempt and you act in ways that are negative toward me, I'm willing to take that chance because I will work with that. I will use that to foster my own growth while I'm in body with you on planet Earth. Hmm. Well, and this is why spirit guides serve such a valuable role, because it is possible for you to use your free will to get pretty far off track in terms of accomplishing your pre-birth intentions. And so then your guides work overtime, so to speak, to bump you back onto a path where you can learn what you had planned to learn. Uh, there's actually a type of pre-birth agreement between two individuals that is sometimes referred to as a bump contract. And what that means is uh, if somebody before they're born is concerned that they're going to get off track and not learn what they want to learn, they create a pre-birth agreement with another soul to bump them back onto the path of desired learning. And the way that you can recognize whether or not you have a bump contract with another person is that it's usually a very brief but very intense relationship that has a major impact mm -hmm. on the direction of your life. That person was bumping you, so to speak, back on the path of greatest learning for you. Yeah, I remember you hearing you saying in one interview that um, if we could see the the sort of uh, like a flow chart of all the possibilities in this life, it would be complex beyond our comprehension. That there's um, that even though maybe seventy percent of the things that happen to us are 
or all the significant things at least are chosen, there there's 30% wiggle room of, of free will or, or, or choice as we go along. But nonetheless, the whole, you know, like you said, backup plans, the whole sort of if A, then B, then, then if, if, if not B, then this. And it, it just be, it becomes this vast, vast thing that it would take some intelligence much more profound than the human to really comprehend. Yeah, one of the mediums w with whom I worked on both books reports that when she goes into somebody's free birth planning session, spirit shows her something that looks to her like an incredibly vast and elaborate flowchart. And it, it's so huge, so vast, so elaborate that it, it's really beyond human mm -hmm. understanding. What that flowchart represents are all the so-called backup plans that the person is putting into place. So when we talk about someone having a life plan or a plan A, they do have a plan A, but there's also a plan B, C, D, E, F, and on and on and on. So many backup plans that, again, it's beyond human understanding. And the reason that those backup plans are created is because the personality has free will. The soul wants the personality to have free will. The soul wants the personality to use the free will because mm -hmm. that's how true learning occurs. And so these backup plans are put into place so that you will have the kinds of experiences you need in order to reach your pre-birth yeah. intention. So then, this means that you are not victims of a scheme of things of a mechanical world or of an autocratic god. The life you're living is what you have put yourself into. Only you don't admit it because you want to play the game that it's happened to you. But let's suppose we admit that I really wanted to get born and that I was the ugly gleam in my father's eye when he approached my mother. That was me. I was desire, and I deliberately got involved in this thing. Look at it that way instead. And that even if I got myself into an awful mess, and I got born with syphilis and the great Siberian itch and tuberculosis and uh, in the Nazi concentration camp, nevertheless, this was a game which was a very far out play. It was a kind of cosmic masochism. But I did it. Isn't that an optimal game rule for life? Because if you play life on the supposition that you're a helpless little puppet that got involved, or if you play it on the supposition that it's a, a frightful, serious risk and that we really ought to do something about it and uh, so on, it's a drag. You play non-bliss in order to be able to experience bliss. And you can go as far out as non-bliss as you want to go. And when you wake up, it'll be great. And it makes you realize, you see, how, how great things are when you forget that that's the way it is. And that's just like black and white. You don't know black unless you know white. You don't know white unless you know black. This is simply fundamental. So then, Here's the drama. My metaphysics, let me be perfectly frank with you, are that there is the central self. You can call it God. You can call it anything you like. And it's all of us. It's playing all the parts of all beings whatsoever, everywhere and anywhere. And it's playing the game of hide and seek with itself. It gets lost, it gets involved in the farest out adventures, but in the end, it always wakes up and comes back to itself. And when you're ready to wake up, you're going to wake up. And if you're not ready, you're going to stay pretending that you're just a little, poor little me. And uh, since you're all here and engaged in this sort of inquiry and listening to this sort of lecture, I assume that you're all on the process of waking up. <laughs>